and and we're connected tonight ha this is a flash at in a perfect world at 8 a.m. Denmark time which is the middle of the night out there in RLM land all my friends and peers and whatnot <laughs> they're all asleep so I'm gonna do radio and uh, I, ha I have a hardcore um, group at BitChute that checks what I do out after it gets posted so I guess this is getting carried out there people are seemingly bored of the mainstream and they're looking for other ways and we've been here we'll be here for a long time we will go nowhere uh, <laughs> I mean as far as abandoning this little thing that we do what Vinny calls it leaving a record and how I think too me, I, I'm just having a good time. And reading now, I'm gotten into the reading links a little bit. So now I'm reading links and trying to be informative in this crazy world that we're in. Uh, let me say the highs. And, and everybody that's on the list in the RLM is probably in bed, but they're logged on <laughs> to the site, to the chat site. And we're going to start with the barman, Grimnir, Moose Girl, Don C. Brackets, Anti Asmo Chow Sidoni Graham Z. I be Don C again. Uh, Java Doctor 2. J Dread Meister Brow Ponder Gander Miss Kate. Rome's Vanna White Vinny. Weather Dork Woodman Z Beth Z. The Phantom Beetle Cyborg Noodle Me. Well, I'm on. Uh, Frumpy Gromit Jays Nines Jays. Kiss. Mmm, Sock Puppet, and Smart Ants. And Vinny's here. Wait a minute. Well, I opened a wire in case you showed up. So if you want to jump in on the show, it's half your show. <laughs> but I figured this was a lot easier for Cert to get to work on uh, Tuesday and work with me on picking her up and whatnot at night than the uh, original time of seven o'clock didn't work out so when you were went off on your little river adventure which was really nice to see the video too looks pretty out that way it must be uh, comfortable to not be surrounded by shit <laughs> and anyway so tonight on a uh, in a perfect world I was gonna read a few linkies uh, I had thought a lot of the Grimner leftovers podcast he was doing a pretty good job if you haven't checked him out he's on the he's on the rerun list over at uh, youtube carries us bit shoot carries us but it's, it's slower to get loaded at bit shoot so if you miss the live show and you're dependent on the reruns like i do that's uh pretty much what we got going on and he mentioned that other sites have accepted our programming and he got in on uh, I lo I Heart Radio, I think it was. I wrote it down. Yeah, I Heart Radio loves Grimnir long time. And I guess we're going along with him, me and Mary and Vince. I don't know. Haven't talked to him about it. But just assume if they took one, they took all. And where do I want to begin on my program this evening? Ah, oh, it's with this. When I was coming on this morning, I got an early morning cat woke me up or the daylight woke me up or something woke me up five o'clock 5 30 something like that uh Cirque's home from work for a few days so she's gonna work at the house things are out of the normal for me and i did the radio this time because i figured my wife would be on her way to work and now she's not so what we do at flashco is we roll with the changes and do what it needs to be done <laughs> Anyway, I think it was Grimner that posted this here link. I don't think he read it on his show. I didn't hear it, but I saw it posted on the main feed of the reallibertymedia.com chat. <laughs> the nucleus of uh, where the people gather. You know, because there's other things to do and other other sites, uh, other sites. There's other things to do on the site besides just the chat. Anyway, we're going to go with Amazon. <laughs> is selling a bracelet that gives you an electric shock 
uh, when you eat too much fast food, bite your nails, or spend too much time on the internet. Now, I'm still going to post a copy of this in the RLM chat like people were going to be there reading it. Vinny's in the RLM chat. My, uh, my buddy I do this program with. So let's see what goes on with this story. It seems a little strange, but I don't know. People are weird. It says, uh, wrist strap uses a small electric current to zap you into giving up your bad habits. It could be used to break habits like smoking, biting nails, or eating junk food. The pain is equivalent to touching a doorknob after rubbing socks on the carpet. To give users more of an incentive, <laughs> the Pavlov app can be downloaded by friends so they can give you a buzz if they catch you eating an extra slice of cake. By Victoria Bell for Mail Online. And this was just published the 17th of June, 2019. Uh, and today, uh, I usually remember the date. Today is the 18th of June, 2019, for all you people keeping track. And it's Tuesday for me. So if you're back home, it's Monday for you. So I'm living in the future again. Now, to continue, to, to continue with this epic story, an armband that promises, promises to help you kick bad habits like eating too much fast food or biting your nails is being sold by Amazon for $242. And they named it properly, too. The Pavlok Bracelet gives users a penalty of a 350 volt electric shock every time they step out of line. <laughs> wow. It works for a wide range of nasty habits, including smoking, sleeping in, spending too much time on the internet, and even sleeping in. Wow. Users have to administer the shocks themselves or the Pavlov app cannot be downloaded by friends so that they can give you a buzz if they catch you out. Some habits, particularly those that are sleep related, such as not waking up at the right time, can be automated via the app. Wow, this is slavery beyond my wildest dreams. Now, if I hadn't known <laughs> that people were in the you know, self-punishment. They do the ass whipping for their self. I would have invested in this long ago, but who knew? <laughs> okay. I mean, 243 bucks a shot. You got to figure profit on that's huge. And there's lots of sheep to buy them so they can go. Bzzz, I suppose. <laughs> Back to the epic story. Users need to wear the, their bands created by Behavioral Technology in SLC, Utah. <laughs> there you go. And well then, <laughs> throughout the day, and give themselves a zap when they engage in the habit they're trying to quit. Oh, this is ridiculous. The company claims that within three to five days, you'll begin to notice your cravings significantly reduced if not gone entirely yeah electroshock therapy <laughs> marketed as you know a, a thing to do so that you can stop bad habits wow but the same people that sold you the bad habits are selling you the cure so there you go with that anyway <laughs> back to the epic saga <laughs> Pavlok allows you to speak your reptile brain's language by adding an unpleasant element or a safe and harmless zap of electricity on your wrist. This means that when you have been taught to love, it conditions your mind to associate an unpleasant feeling with your bad habit, according to the manufacturer. It is priced at $242 on Amazon's website, but it's in pounds. 
193 in pounds. It has 150 shocks per charge. So depending on how much of a rule breaker you are, it could last a while. <laughs> yeah, wow. Inventor Manish Seti says that while it isn't as powerful as a shock from a taser, it still delivers enough voltage voltage to shock you, make you jump. Wow. Isn't that freaking awesome? You can go to Amazon now and get a self-mutilating tool to stop mutilating yourself. Or you could just balls up and stop doing whatever the fuck you want to stop doing. I figure if I'm doing it, it's because I want to do it. If I didn't want to do it, I would stop. Shocking me is just going to piss me off, so I'll probably punch somebody else. <laughs> but my peers on the radio, you know, Vince, and Mary, and Grimner, good old Hal Anthony. I think the cornerstone of all them is, you know, stand up and do what you have to do on your own. Quit expecting the group to do it for you. So what I'm reading about is basically for sheep and something for me to have a giggle on because no fucking way am I doing that. If I uh, ever decide to stop participating in my bad habits, I prefer it would be my own choice to make, not the result of torturing myself into doing the right thing. <laughs> that's, that's insane. Okay, <laughs> quit fucking around. Back to the epic story. <laughs> All right. He told ABC News, it feels like if you were to touch a doorknob after rubbing your socks on the carpet, he added, there's a, real, there's a real power in using a little bit of pain to help you break your bad habits. The idea was born out of Mr. Seti's social media addiction. <laughs> so he's a masochist gone public. I suffered from ADHD and found myself addicted to Facebook. I wrote a blog post where I hired someone to slap me every time I went on Facebook. And my productivity skyrocketed, he said. On the other hand, none of my many fitness track trackers motivated me at all. So I thought, why are there so many devices tracking what I do, but not changing what I do and Pavlock <laughs> was born bah. although there are many testimonies on the internet from people who have successfully quit bad habits using the watch not everyone is convinced some experts say that the band's technology <laughs> is not a science well, science is not a science either, so shove that in a pipe and burn it. Dr. Greg Kaysen, a psychologist, just said, psychologicalist, whatever the hell that is, devices like this don't really work unless they are locked onto people's wrists. They're going to take them off. <laughs> yeah, sure they are. Reviews on Amazon's website have also been mixed. One customer wrote, Wristband is a little awkward, but it does allow for the contacts to be positioned closely to your skin for the best results. I've only used the button on the device to administer the shock. I can't comment on how the hand motion function works. The app is okay and does give some information and videos on how to beat whatever habit you're trying to break. At 100% on a decent charge, it is more than enough of a zap to get your attention. I'm glad I bought it. So far, I, I believe it is working. It's not going to cure a lifelong issue in a few days, so you have to stick to their plan 
and really work on it. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah, stick to the plan, folks. That's uh, that's what's important, I think, in the world now. Doing what you're freaking told to do. <laughs> One way or another way. Electric shocks to the wrist. Hey, I'm just now seeing the... Uh, <laughs> See in the chat, Mr. Vinny's typing something back to me. Mm. Oh, he's telling jokes on the RLM chat. But <laughs> he's he's uh, he's a funny little character. Anyway, I'm just doing links, Vinny. Hold on. I'll get to you when uh, we do a dork table on Saturday. I'll quiz you about your experience over the last week. Got another gem for you folks out there in Radio Land. <laughs> I hope this is uh, entertaining because made me the last one just made me giggle like a child. I'm having a good show today. Okay, but my next spot uh, link is called. Uh, what is the name of it? Stop treating government with respect. That's the next link I'm gonna read to my hardcore twenty three out there in radio land <laughs> uh well yeah maybe he did their weather dork and uh, i'm stealing it and uh, i'm reading it and i'm posting it so shut up <laughs> the dork has corrected me on the uh on the main feed of the rlm chat because i took it off the site so putting it back on the site come hey stop doing that you rerun guy okay now this is from government slaves and i stole it from rob works it's called Stop Treating Government with Respect. It's become nothing but a weapon fought over by people who want to smash each other and you. And it's by government slaves on the June the 18th, 2019. And, and it opens with Emigrate while you still can. <laughs> anyway, the government in the United States has increasingly become a powerful weapon that two warring tribes repeatedly seize control of and then use against each other. For those of us who are averse to being smashed, it's long past time to consider the machinery of the state as nothing more than a bludgeon in the hands of dangerous maniacs. Well, that's pretty much the gist of it so far. I, I like this story. Dangerous, indeed. It's hard to beat the sight, the insight into the malicious heart of government offered by Rep. Ted Lou on CNN in December. Wow, there you go. Politicians on public uh, news programs, and they don't call them news programs for nothing. Jeez, if you don't know, <laughs> let me interrupt the show with this. If you don't know about all this mind control and CIA, and you think they're a bunch of stories, right? No, the stories were things like the moon landing, the JFK assassination, 9-11. The things that you actually see, <laughs> those are the frauds. And they just double up with more bullshit, you know, and stories and links and history and written down. And look at this and look at that. And then somewhere along the road, you have the truth. And it's all, I think it's different for all of us in some kind of way that doesn't allow us to agree. <laughs> Back to this epic story. I would love to be able to regulate the content of speech, the California Democrat told CNN's Brianna Killer. <laughs> the First Amendment prevents me from doing so. And that's simply a function of the First Amendment. Okay. Lou obviously takes it for granted that many politicians would muzzle their enemies if it were permitted. And that only meddlesome legal strictures prevent them from enacting their dark desires. <laughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and that brought a brought a choke <laughs> those strictures no longer look so strict new york state's blue tribe government last last year repeatedly abused regulatory power in assaults against 
independent institutions. First, it sought to intimidate financial firms and insurance companies into breaking ties with organizations that advocate self-defense rights. This emulated the Obama administration's earlier Operation Choke Point <laughs> scheme, by which powerful bank regulatory agencies engaged in an effort of intimidation and threats to put legal industries but oh, hold on, I got a window blink come up and interrupt me. They dislike out of business, according to John Barlow, something like that, of the Competitive Enterprise Institute. New York officials followed up by threatening to declare truant any children attending private schools whose curricula didn't win state approval. <clears throat> state approval. Wow. And, and to those of you that don't understand that state is a fiction you created in your head and you agree with these lying sacks of shit that want you get inoculated, <laughs> tax you, and take your guns away, and not let you talk to anybody, control what you say on the internet, who you say it to, how loud you talk, what color clothes you wear, uh, you know. Are your feet too big to even bother making you a pair of decent shoes? <laughs> Stuff that's just, you know, right in your face but invisible. <laughs> and I kind of laugh at it, but uh, luck, luck is with me in life where mm, you can do whatever you want to me physically, but you can't have my mind. <laughs> I learned that, oddly enough, from between Reuben Carter and Bob Dylan. They can lock you up, but they can't lock up your mind. So I guess I should get back to this epic tale <laughs> about government and such and all the wonders of it. And I'm only going to go with another paragraph of it. And then there's a continue, and it's at Whore Media that it continues at. <laughs> so it continues, for his part, Donald Trump, Red Tribe Jeff Heffy demands unwavering personal loyalty. He promised to punish companies that defy his nationalistic economic schemes by moving production overseas. They will be taxed like never before, he vowed last summer of Harley Davidson. And the president, who once described freedom of the press as frankly disgusting, Double down on his predecessor's hostility to journalistic independence by threatening to retaliate against the critical Washington Post with antitrust action, higher postage rates, and taxes on Amazon, which shares Jeff Bezos as its owner. Okay, that's the end of that. Um, there, I stole that from Rob Works earlier happen to repost it but wow how did we get into this mess this is ridiculous can't be like this i mean if it is like this where i in my personal you know existence i don't live in that millionaire you know trading stocks and shit like that kind of life i got a real quiet like grimner he was talking friday night on a the balls to the wall and yeah life everybody's daily life is supposed to be mundane and boring man if you have too much excitement th that throws the balance off that's, that's why it's so devastating and shocking and, and who'd want to live like that daily any damn way hmm. now there was a time in life where I did but that was what I wanted I was looking for Excitement. I was in my 20s, my 30s. Now, coming up to the big 6 0 in September, eh, it's getting closer and closer. And um, with uh, any luck, I should make it to September, anyhow, and start a new decade of interruption and disagreement with my fellows. 
And now, there's a few people I, I actually do agree with that I chat with. And then uh, there's a handful of people where we just don't communicate on a, a civilized in a civilized fashion. So I don't. I've uh, limited my my or exercise in my negative side, my negative freedom of speech to very few people. You know, and uh, and if I can't get along with the other people, I just don't try to. You know, nothing personal. It's just less shit in the stew. You know, because we're all sharing this site, this chat site. And if I'm going to spend all my time, you know, paying attention to the people I disagree with about the petty shit we disagree about, it just doesn't go anywhere. So I've learned from other people that I've seen on the site how to do that. It's not so hard. But having your own opinion and being all excited about it, type, 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 it's easy. Then again, I, I've replaced that with just gibberish and, you know, making up some crazy story about something. Uh, just break the tension and the monotony. There's plenty of links on there to keep you busy. We have the research net. I mean, these people know what they're doing on the link department. And we got variety, too, because there's still lingerers, you know, hangers on like me post music and you know movies movie clips should i still do that uh but my links uh that's what pretty much what i do i don't do very much in the important side of the shit but i have and i got really disappointed when uh, uh medicine by death was taken off by the uh, person that posted it didn't want it on the internet anymore so it kind of kicked me in the balls about posting internet links and I figure if you're listening to the radio and this particular program or maybe even RLM in general because this is a it's more of a liberty based site people that we deal with the system but we are not held ha captive against our will without our knowledge you know it's not that kind of uh, captivity when you realize what the truth is about the government, then maybe that's the freedom in that, that there is in this, is to be able to look at it and see it for what it truly is and not be looking up at it on a pedestal and think, oh, it's so wonderful. Oh, I'm so lucky, blah, 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 blah. You, well, you're really not. That, that's the state of mind, I think, that you can be in just about anywhere you live. So it's the person that's either happy or miserable. But we got a lot of miserable people. You know, they, they're unindated in all the negative shit. The immigration and the Muslims and the 9-11 and the Kennedys. And all the good stuff that the CIA does for us. All these military coups that the United States has either financed or been involved directly in and they run around printing this crap about freedom and it's the most restrictive freaking country there is and you have the illusion of freedom I see that and on some personal levels there's a lot of freedom but when you start engaging with society and the public and people outside then the freedom level drops that's what that's what they were talking about in the beginning you know, because you got to be one way at home, you can be yourself. But when you go out in public, you know, if you're a hothead or an idiot, uh, society used to expect you to contain those uh, behaviors, I would say that you'd call it, and behave in a, a proper fashion. They had signs all over all the stores that went, read something like this. We reserve the right to refuse service to anyone, you know, and they would have little rules like shoes and shirts because if they're in a grocery store or a place that had a lot of glass, people break a glass and you step on it, then you're going to think it's their fault that you stepped on the broken glass when if you wear shoes, chances are you're not going to get cut. And uh, back in the day, not everybody was... Uh, concerned about how they smelled when they went out in public in the 70s 60s so 
uh, to protect our noses from your armpits, you know, a shirt would be worn. That that wasn't asking too much. And now everything's all fucked up and backwards, and the whole population wants to uh, embrace the absolute freaking weirdest crap there is, and fuck off the the shit that I grew up with as boring and dull now looks appealing where when I was in it young I wanted to do different things and as I got older I saw oh as you get older you might like that life so under the uh, the guise of this freedom society is just being pushed into uh, this puddle that has no no has no shape it's just a blob and they got all the colors and they try to put them in a pattern to be attractive and all I see is that's never gonna work people nah. what people need is uh, not to be joined together in groups of a thousand that's how you keep them that that's a prison that you're in that group that you're in I'm sure I'm in a group of my own something I just don't uh, I don't willingly look for that group to be in. So like, like, like say now I'm, I'm gray in the hair, I get gray beard. So to the young, now I'm old. I look my age. So that puts me in that group. And I think traditionally in life, depending on your upbringing, uh, the elders basically are the ones that got where they got. They're the ones that are older. They know something. The problem is a lot of people who are elders are like Trump. Trump's older than me. He's like 70-something years old. But he's a limousine baby from you know, a really bad fuck family. <laughs> he does horrible shit globally. And people praise him for holding an office that represents a company that fucks everybody the same that's not what they tell us though it's like the military you know see the world and all this that and the other and then you read a story about a, a vet that cracked and broke the code and decided to go public with, with what happened and that guy's story is a lot different than all this hoopla about Muslims Muslim this and Muslim that and the way they pull this off is they isolate the problems in the areas so they can write about it to show all the other people that don't live in an area that has that what's coming to you. <laughs> it's a fear. It's a manufactured fear on a level of government and decision making that we don't take any part in. They call it voting. But now you're just picking a suit to go uh, do what they want to do in your name so they promise you in the beginning oh yeah I'm gonna do this for you and I'm gonna do that for you and whatever they tell you is gonna happen even if it does happen the will the real wealthy people the, the billionaires and the zillionaires they're the ones that get all the tax breaks <laughs> then the working class is so just fucking enamored because the wealthy made more money out of their backs. <laughs> Thank you for taking more money from us, you wonderful wealthy people. And here we are, doing the same shit, day in and fucking day out, like, like it's cool. And then you have <clears throat> this off-brand mind. And it's not a group. This is the thing that it really insults the fuck out of me about this. Anarchy is not a fucking action. Anarchy is the lack of action. The willingness to participate in the society is not an anarchist attitude, state of mind, or being. <laughs> it's opposite. People that fight and beg the government to let them have their freaking way are slaves to the state. Anarchists don't do these things. But what happens is the newspapers are told to title them groups, people that go around breaking shit, whoever hires them to do that, or maybe they're 
Maybe they are ignorant enough to live in a neighborhood and go destroy the neighborhood that they live in to get back at somebody. I, I find it hard to believe. But what I don't find hard to believe is the mob mentality. You know, if it starts and you're there, 99% of the people are just going to jump in and fight it too. It's weird how that works. Me, nah, uh, for some reason, yeah, I've seen a few of those mob things in, in the bars that I drank in North Carolina where a whole group of people just be fucking punching on each other. I ain't getting near it. I'm going outside away. And the odd thing about it is I had friends involved in this shit that never confronted me about why I didn't jump in and help. <laughs> it was, oh, you took off pretty quick there, didn't you? <laughs> Fuck yeah. And I get my face punched in because somebody's poking somebody's wife or some crap like that. You bar shit. Like uh, what Woody was talking about yesterday on the RLM chat. Because apparently... Old Larkin Rose, you know, the guy that, he's been pretty vocal about government and what government truly is. So, I don't think that's participating in government. I think that's talking about government. So, he's not a politician. Now, I think he claims that he's an anarchist. Okay. Well, he's a public anarchist. Now, I'm not. Maybe on the radio in a bit, in a way, but in life, in my physical life, I'm, I'm not. Because I go along with the society that I'm in. And if society calls me an anarchist and because of something violent, well, I'm not doing anything violent. But I'm still participating in their society. So, for some reason, when you bring up the idea of anarchy... Uh, I think the opposition tries to turn it into something physical that you do when it's uh, in reality to me it's just something that I think it's a way that I believe but it's not being against or for <clears throat> anybody I don't think uh, I just want to be left alone if I choose to be left alone there you go that's what I was looking for I couldn't figure out quite how to explain it uh, when I don't choose to be alone in my home, I go outside and go mix with the people. But uh, I don't take a political agenda out there. I'm going to take over Denmark and I'm going to be their next pre uh, president or prime minister. I could give two flying shits about anything that, you know, that big. I think really small. I think, uh, the wife and the dog and the cat are more than enough. You know, I don't need all the uh, all the trappings of the outside bullshit anymore. But I could do that and be a uh, you know make it make some kind of drama happen if I wanted to lose my mind and be an idiot. But I know better. <clears throat> so sadly, what what I see happening is. The same people out there that think like I do, like say Rob or Grimm, like I usually would quote, uh, no matter how, how many times they type, uh, come on, meteor, or fuck the police, or whatever, it's just a mental, th it's not a physical thing. They're just writing an idea. It's different. Now, the cops are actually out there murdering people and maiming them with guns on purpose. For whatever reason, and the odd part is, every time I read about it, the other guy that got shot's unarmed. And this is acceptable. People are just like, okay, next. Next crisis, that they can't even be bothered to stop into a crisis to look at it and take an action. Now, it's just, what's next? I call it the disaster of the week. And you see some activity on the reallibertymedia.com chat room tonight. But of course it's late night, so there's a few people that have, you know, they come on and post a few things, check on it, see if anybody looked or not. But there's no, uh, <laughs> it's the middle of the night, folks. <laughs> so there's nothing really happening. Now, I have a really boring link for you at this point. Let's see, where am I at the show? Okay. I have... And it's called, here, let me post it on the main feed. 
Might as well get used to this. That way when I do a show when there are people around. That um, I am trained properly to host the program in a way that suits everybody's happy button. <laughs> and this is called the Khazar's Kingdom. Gog and Magog. Jewish Khazars. Top that. <laughs> Come on, Benny. Top that. Anyway. It's got some kind of prayer thing, Ezekiel, something at the top. I ain't going to read it. But I am going to read the story because I like the title. I hope it's good. <laughs> Introduction. A thousand years before the establishment of the modern state of Israel, there existed a Jewish kingdom in the eastern fringes of Europe astride the Don and Volga rivers. So begins a thesis by Jewish author Kevin Allen Burek. The kingdom of which he speaks appears at first consideration to be comprised of nearly as much disinformation, misinformation, and myth information. And that made it sound like a guy to lisp. That wasn't funny. And curiously, no information as there is actual provable historical fact. Yet upon closer scrutiny, this kingdom known as Khazaria, or the kingdom of the Khazars, is clearly revealed in a vast body of historical evidence, much of which has come to light only in the last three to five decades. The mysterious kingdom, which has sculpted our modern world to an astounding and alarming degree. Once occupied an immense land area of over a million square miles, extending from western Hungary, Austria, eastward to the Aral Sea, north to the upper Volga and its southern region, extending to the Caucasus Mountains between the Black and Caspian Seas. Wow, there's some geography for you. Because I can read a map, and I know where these things are on the map. But I don't have them, you know, memorized. So hearing about it is familiar, but I don't get the visual of that particular map in my head like I would America. Because I traveled it a lot. Hey, baby, what's up? I just found my wife. She was on my shoulder. <laughs> okay, back to my epic tale. It was at that time literally the largest country on earth. It has only been in the last several decades. However, that greater documented evidence from ancient manuscripts has come to light and revealed the astonishing historical truth of this ancient kingdom and its connection to the origins of modern day Israel. Okay, now see, this is what I'm, I'm always harping on the truth, right? If they didn't have the ability to manipulate us with 50 different stories to, to check into to prove something, they just had the truth, whatever it was. But that's not the way this works. The way it works is through the deception and misdirection. They told this story all those years ago, so it's got to be true. Okay, what does it mean? Well, I don't know. They wrote it in Greek. Well, then how did you read it? Well, they translated it to this king in England, translated it to English. Well, to me, that means that the king wrote what he wanted to read. <laughs> That's a translation. Huh, baby? She's making coffee. But when you think about it, when you trust people to translate things for you, now when you trust a stranger to translate, do you really, <laughs> I mean, Really? A stranger? Somebody you don't even know? And here they did it thousands... Yeah, no, they did it thousands of years ago. And here we are today. What? No, 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 no. And the reason I say that is because when I look around at the results of society, then the story, the how we got here part, does never fit. I'll get into that in more detail in another time. But now... Back to this epic tale of whoever, I guess, the Jews. 
though little known to the West and, for that matter, to even those currently occupying its ancestral land, the Khazar Kingdom has been responsible for substantially shaping the history and political landscape of Europe, and specifically Western Asia, but also, to a remarkable degree, the entirety of human events on this planet. Arthur, Arthur Kostler, author of the twenty, the thirteenth tribe, twenty. Wow, I got twenty on my mind. Easily the most expansive single work on the subject states the story of the Khazar Empire as it slowly emerges from the past, begins to look like the most cruel hoax which history has ever perpetrated. Ooh. Wow, so apparently somebody's calling somebody a liar and their pants are on fire. Let me go with this story here. Hmm. So, this is the story of a kingdom of belligerent, warlike, Caucasian nomads. <laughs> Having no linked ancestry with anything Israelite this side of Noah. Yet, Adopting Talmudic J. Judaism, that's that G Jew book, and becoming the dominant and virtually only current force in 21st century international Jewry. Yeah, this stuff gets dangerous, man. That's that, and it's got the it's got the ear of so many people. Or we believe it does. You, you see them bowing and going to their little buildings and kissing walls. <laughs> Licking little children, and they've got no fucking shame. I mean, Joe Biden will sniff a kid right on camera. Doesn't even fucking care what you see him do. That's how above us these fuckers truly are. Hmm. Ah, just thought I'd throw that, uh, you know, opine in there just uh, for your hearing enjoyment. Okay, back to... <laughs> I know, I shouldn't break from the stories when it's this good. Should have just kept reading. But I can't help myself. I, I get I got that Mary Mary thing. She likes to inter, interrupt herself with herself. And so do I. <laughs> it's priceless. All right. Back to reality, people. Back to reality. <clears throat> In this, it will be shown that the cry of anti Semitism hurled against those who do oppose the international actions of one's calling themselves Jews, would be much like an immigrated Scotsman to America deciding to live on an Apache Indian reservation, coming to dominate its politics and economics, and then claiming that anyone disagreeing with his political and social agenda is racist and anti-Apache in their beliefs. Wow, that, I hope you can read. The, I'm going to post this in the blog, uh, the the podcast thing too. And if I, if, I hope people will read this because hardcore twenty out there. I mean, hell, at least we know. So it's something. It's better than believing the crap. <laughs> you know, supporting Israel when Israel is the most evil fucking place on the planet. Anyway, <clears throat> sorry about that. Back to reality. <laughs> What under different circumstances could prove to be a dry treaty on Eastern Europe Jewish history is, if closely examined, actually a narrative of events that have laid a sequential pathway to and beyond the destruction of the New York World Trade Center on September 11, 2001. This historical timeline has been fixed in its present course, which, by all appearances and in most unexpected manner, is culminating in the fulfillment of the biblical prophecies of Armageddon. But then, it has always been so with prophecy. The most consistent aspect in the nature of prophetic fulfillment is that it is consistently surprising. God has invariably worked to complete his desires prophetically in ways that have not been understood 
until revealed in retrospect in the light of their actual happening. Wow, these people are pretty deep. Hmm. And continues, an historical perspective. Shortly after the death of Muhammad in A.D. 632, because <laughs> I think Hans and Goober were there that day, according to Columbia University professor D.M. Dunlop, Arab armies began a campaign northward, sweeping through the wreckage of two empires and carrying all before them till they reached the great mountain barrier of the Caucasus. Oh, window of opportunity. And I'm getting back to my story. I had a window pop up on. I'm playing a game and it interrupts my uh, thing. I forgot to turn the damn thing off and now I don't want to. So, we're having a history lesson. This barrier once passed. Dunlop observes the road lay open to the lands of Eastern Europe. Had the caliphate, the armies of Muslim caliphs, mounted that immense geological deterrent unchallenged, the history of Europe, and indeed the rest of the Judeo-Christian world, would have been been vastly different than it is now. That's why Mary calls it history, because she's done enough reading to know. And it's it's all subjective, so there's going to be people out there that still it makes them feel good inside to go along with the, the old story. <laughs> the new story? No, I don't want to try that. that. That could crush my sense of reality. I end up talking to my cat and my dog and being a nut job. And who wants that? <laughs> I think that's all. That's what we're all like in the first damn place. Oh, and I, I think I've mentioned it, but I sure like saying this. I figured out who the aliens on Earth are. Are you sitting down? Really? Okay. It's us. <laughs> there is no way to explain. Oh, I want to interrupt with, uh, I was listening to Grim last, uh, do his uh, leftover program. And we share a, an idea beyond all the RLM stuff, the political crap. And, and he said it, and I think I've said it, and it's the insane among us that think they're in charge have no, no regard for, for life of any kind. Human, animal, vegetable, mineral, man. It doesn't matter. It's, we're things. We're things to be bought and sold. Doesn't matter what you're made of. Carbon-based life form, fuck it. It's all shit now. Fuck it all. How much can we make off it? That's where these people are. They're open about it. We can see it if you look at it. It's not hidden from anyone. So there better be some changes coming because if, if it upsets people, I mean, I consider that Grimm and Rob peers. You know, we think alike, that kind of thing. So it rocks me as it rocks them. And sooner or later, when you have that kind of frequency going on, something, something's going to snap somewhere. Mm. And I'm not talking about these stupid fucking wars they keep fighting over oil. I mean, something in society, is, it's due to break. It hasn't broken in a long time. I think the last time it snapped was like 1970 in America. And the government came out and said, no, shut the fuck up or we'll kill all of you next. So they shut up. And they continued with their war for about five more years. Then they got creative about how they controlled the press so that the American public didn't know how many fucking wars these people were in until they were done with them. Then they start talking about it after after the cause, you know, after the fact. So now we have internet. <laughs> oh, this is good. It's, it both hurts us and it helps us at the same time because it... If you're indoctrinated into your thing, whatever your thing is, as I am, I'm into my anarchy state of mind. Not my physical, go out there and conquer Poland. You know, Hitler fucked that all up. He had his chance, but I can do it right. <laughs> See, it's, whatever we know, it's not about what we know. And what the truth is behind everything is so, it's mind-numbing, I think. And like this stuff I'm reading about, the Jews hijacked this religion. They're not really Jews, they're people. 
claiming to be Jews and using that protection as a way to do the horrible shit, sick, the oh, sorry, the horrible sick shit they do and get away with it. And nobody can stop them. Nobody even wants to stop them. What are you going to say? I mean, I, I want to stop them. I got 23 card core listeners out of that one because it's so unpopular with the real world to know the truth and say anything about it. And then free speech died a long time ago. This stuff we're doing, it's not free speech. We're, we're labeled something because we're not following the stories that they tell in society to keep the sheep in line. We don't seem to do that. That's why we're so popular with Hansel. And the sad thing about him, I don't know, I don't know anybody like him in real life. So I think the the bad side of me likes to play with him so much because he's so unique. You know, wow, he's he calls me a relic because I'm a I'm a pothead. <laughs> and uh, I sit around all day and smoke drugs, and uh, that's it, right? So I grew up with people talking that shit. Uh, I've heard it my whole life. And, and now that pot's legal, uh, here's another link Grim was on. They legalized weed in, uh, I guess, Colorado or someplace like that. And they've said wherever they have the dispensaries, crime has dropped to acceptable levels, if nothing. Because when you stop, you know, when you stop shitting on people, and forcing them to do this and that, to break the law, to go get something that the government should have never involved itself in in the first place. Things change. <clears throat> but the people that don't participate, hold on one second. But the people that don't participate in, in the black market world of pot, say they all they know is Mexican cartels. <laughs> it's stupid. You know, it's uh, it's the same as the oil. The the oil comes from the Middle East to whatever other country. Well, they sell it to a broker at a at a bulk price. You know, and then they process it into something else, and sh then they send it, transport it somewhere else. And then they, of course, they tax the shit out of it. So when you're paying, well, I guess gas went up finally in the States. I was hearing it was hitting like four bucks. So when you're paying four dollars for a gallon of gas, you're probably seriously buying like one penny's worth of gas. And all the rest of this money that you're paying is all in taxes and transportation and profit. But what you're getting for your money, nah. No, nah, no. Nah. When you buy in billions and you sell in singles, <laughs> so that whoa, this is how the um, government gets away with some of the numbers they come up with with street street prices on drugs. They find a a thousand pounds of cocaine, say, and what they do is they calculate the price of that shipment at the gram price per gram what street price is so if the gram cost say we'll give it a flat number a hundred dollars <laughs> that's 28 grams per ounce 16 ounces per pound and 2,000 times so that number just goes right through the freaking sky up to the heavens above us right but not to say that the guy that sold it to the broker didn't make his nickel, but it's not the number that they're telling you in the press because they're using a wrong equation to come up with an answer. But John, you know, John and Mary that sit in the living room watching CNN and Fox, what the fuck do they know about cocaine in the first place? <laughs> it's, it's, it's like a, I'm a Jew, but. Show me a diamond. I don't know a diamond from a piece of glass. Don't care. Don't want to know. And it surprised people in my life. They go, what? You don't you don't love diamonds? No, not really. I mean, dude, rocks. <laughs> Didn't go over very well. Anyway, I'm going to get back to my story. I had to interrupt my rant for a personal rant. 
but man, the, life is so cheap now to the uh, the consumer, the politician, the voter. I mean, they'll they want violence against the other side, violence instead of what's good for everybody. Let's try to get along and figure out what's the right thing. No, I want my way, and if you don't give me my way, I'm going to hit you with a brick. Okay, people, that's what you wanted. I hope you're happy with it. And if that's not what you have, and that's not what you want, we need to start making that clear to these idiots. Because the idiots in power keep screaming, war, war, war. I saw links. Yeah, I was going to inter- I'm going to go back into a rant. But I saw links about the Japanese freighter that was attacked by Iran. Why? In the fucking world. And it's always the same crap. They pulled this on Syria, too. So Iran's having talks with Japan in Iran, and they have a Japanese freighter leaving their port. So they decide to bomb it. Why? Well, of course, so that they can get America into a war. Why else would they do a thing like that to a Japanese freighter? Huh? 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 Oh, oil tanker. My, my air. I mean, doesn't it make sense that Iran wants to do business with Japan, so they're going to do it, and then after they do it, then they're gonna, when they're leaving, they're going to bomb that J- Japanese for <laughs> oil tanker <laughs> so that the U.S. can get in there and save them from... The Japanese retaliation, maybe? <laughs> I don't know. I guess it makes sense to some people. The, the warmonger fucking crowd out there, they're small, but they're there. You know, the bomb them, shoot them, all that, those idiots. But I guess it's easy to talk when, uh, when you're not the idiot out there with the gun doing the murdering. Back to the story, finally. It was at the, I think I read that line. No, or did I? Let me check it. No, I didn't. It was at the Caucasus, however, that the Arabs encountered the Khazars, initiating a war that lasted over a century and effectively prevented Europe from becoming Islamic. So powerful socially and militarily were the Khazars that, as Kevin Allen Brook relates in his work, the Jews of Khazaria, a 10th century emperor of the Byzantines, Roman Empire, Constantine, poor, whoa, there's a freaking word, Porphyri, I can't even say it, Porphyrogenitus, hey, hey, there's a, I I hope Vinny hears that one, He'll, he'll be coming up on the RLM using that as his name. All right, sent correspondence to the Khazars marked with a gold seal worth three solidi. More than the two solidi that always accompanied letters to the Pope of Rome, the Prince of the Rus, and the Prince of the Hungarians. Now, see that, wow, you got to remember too, is how many, there's all these continents, and on every continent there's countries in every fucking country there is there's their own history about fucking war that goes back to blah 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 whenever they started now hmm, some of it's true obviously you can see that from relics and history and some of it is bullshit and what i have the hardest time figuring out is the truth from the bullshit because some of the bullshit is written so convincingly that how could you not believe it? You'd have to be insane not to believe it. Look at it. It's right there in black and white. Proof! It's true. (laughs) And then you come across a thing like a Bible or a a Jew book, whatever the fuck the Jew book's called. I I don't remember. Sorry, Jews. But uh, I know you want to run my life and own me and all that crap, but mm, not in this lifetime. Try it next time. <laughs> uh, oh, oh, yeah, I know I keep interrupting this great story with my own shit, but I don't know. We all have different beliefs. Some people believe there's aliens. I be- I'm starting to believe we're the aliens. And the more I look at the way we treat each other, 
the more sense it really makes. We don't know how we got here. We don't have a clue about where we're going. We don't care about what anything means or what anything. Nothing fucking matters. It's all about, eh, have a good time. Well, I guess as a hedonist, I shouldn't speak harshly against it, but the truth be told, I mean, even even I find it necessary to do certain things because they need to be done. <laughs> and, well, you know, you have your limits. Whatever your limits are to put up with, whatever it is in life you're putting up with or doing or whatever you call it. Because, I, man, I hear a lot of problems, lots and lots and lots of them. Bombings and you know, coup d'etats in Venezuela, and everybody's behind them, why can't you just mind your own fucking business about other people's uh, political stance, I suppose I'm getting at. I don't really care what your political stand is until you come into my house and try to force me to accept your political stand. And whatever my wife's political stand is, I have yet to figure it out. I don't I don't even know if she has one. It's more like a fuck politics <laughs> stand than a, you know, she's not out there picketing. She doesn't join groups. You know, she's not a feminist, but she's female. She does female stuff. And she, I don't know, she's obviously a she, but all that, uh, all that stuff I read on minds, because there's a lot of younger people, they speak this new language of, uh, symbols and uh, little catchphrases and words that mean this now and words you know like slang shit like that and I've gone through it so many times I think I went through it in the 60s went through it in the 70s and that was it that bored me I couldn't keep up so if people it's like my thing about not learning Danish same with slang and my mother-in-law I'll tell you if you haven't heard this one it's the greatest story I have about my mother-in-law. When I first met her, and she was, wasn't was sure if I was going to learn to speak Danish or if I could or if I had, whatever. But she told me this in English. She said, if you learn to speak Danish and we ever want to talk about something and we don't want you to know what it is, we'll use slang. And if you ever figure out what that slang means, we'll change it to something else. And I thought, wow, that's the coolest thing I ever heard. You know, well, that level of being honest about, because women talk about shit they don't want men to hear. And some, well, in my day. So she's more, uh, my mother-in-law is my age. So we, we have an understanding about life that just, it uh, goes beyond talk. It's, it, the time frame that we're from is so different than the one we're in that it's like we know what we're looking at. Yeah, it's bullshit. Okay, we don't need to talk about it in English or Danish. But she kind of gives herself away in, in little ways that lead me to, to think that that's what they're talking about because she's like her, like you know, she's like minded is I, that's a horrible way to put it, but the anarchisty kind of mind people, they live in society but they carry themselves in a special way that we recognize among each other. Ah, I'll give you another example. My buddy down at the bar. He, uh, the guy, he's a really cool dude. He's a little younger than me. He's, uh, fit. he's good. He, we have a birthday in September. To, he's the 10th. Found out a lot about him the other day. He brought his Harley down. He's been dying to show me this bike since uh, April because April is the, his, his, his insurance time is April to November. He doesn't pay to, to ride in the, in the winter. And so he, he brought his bike down, and I finally showed up when he had. He said, hey, you want to take a look? I got it outside. So I put my pack up and go outside with him, and he offers to let me ride his 1998 Harley Davidson. And I had to tell him the truth. No, I don't have a license. And But I told him the truth about bikes, too. And I said, I haven't been on a bike. I rode a trike for a while, but haven't been on a bike since I was a teenager. No more bikes for me. But it was so um, heartwarming to be offered, hey, take it for a ride around the parking lot if you want to. Whoa. <laughs> uh, but 
being honest is more important to me now than having a kick. You know, I'm too old. And if something should happen, and if it did, it would be me. Because <laughs> I'm so small, and those bikes are a little heavy. you got to know how to balance them, or you're fucked. And there you go. And to take it a step further, I asked him if he did anything besides just own the bar. He is an electrician, <laughs> so, you know, my interests, my birthday month, the guy owns a bar. Now, there's a good friend to have, and it wasn't like I was intending to do anything. I just met, met the guy. He likes to speak English a little bit, practices English with me, and, it's, and the, the similarities between us are, are just amazing. Yet, two different, completely different people. But it shows me that he's got the anarchist mind behind all the the bar and the job and the wife and all the crap he carries around with him. And he, he said he's going to uh, Austria in September for the uh, backer. Let me see, I wrote it down. The Facker. F-A-A-K-E-R. It's, like, uh, it's like Sturgis, only in Europe. And they seemed a little bit more uh, represented by not just Harley Davidson, but all kinds of people on every kind of bike you could imagine riding. And they had people there, and uh, I saw the I saw the link from 2017. Very impressive that you know when I do just relax with people and they tell me stuff, it's the good shit in life. You know, I'm not listening to Trump is so wonderful, politics, religion, and Hey, want to ride my Harley? <laughs> so, uh, you, I, that's why I, I tell you guys on the radio, I think that whatever I get in life, I just put myself out there to get it. Doesn't mean I have to take it. You know, I can say no, but to be offered things in life out of generosity because people like you, that's a wonderful thing to experience, you know. And it might sound like, you know, my usual bragging, but crying out loud, I got a freaking great life at the level of life that I live at, uh, which some people are just stressed. You know, the responsibilities take control of them. They don't take control of the responsibility. <laughs> it's very difficult to explain. I suppose it's a matter of, I see it, how, how seriously am I willing to take it so I can be stressed about it and... Nah, some things nah, they just go over me or around me, but through me. Mm, now, nah, if you hit me, then I'm going to keep it. So it's, uh, I guess, a matter of uh, how I see the reality thing. You know, uh, what you allow into your life is your choice. Just like the story I'm reading, because there's a lot of us that were raised with the opposite. You know, the Jews are the chosen people and all this anti-Semite bullshit that the people sitting in the seats of power in that group truly aren't what they're claiming to be. They stole it from other people. They took it. And they forgot to change the name along the way. So, guess who's getting screwed? And, oh, by the way, the no-hide laws, laws are coming. And I've seen more and more people posting links on Minds.com. Tell you what, if you're on the Real Liberty Media or if you're one of the Hardcore 20 on BitChute, hmm, Go over to Minds and check it out. It's kind of a weird site. It's hard to define uh, what an individual might get out of it because there's a lot of different input. There's groups. There's individuals. Uh, it's kind of like a Facebook. They're, they're starting to show signs of uh, rules and regulatory activity. I read a rumor that uh, what's it? Google has financial ties to it now. But in the end, we're the fringe of the fringe, and we're never going to play without the cool kids. There's too many of them. They, they sit at every fucking table now. So, you know, they're going to uh, gonna control us one way or another way, I suppose. But for the moment, while this thing is still in its infancy, this freedom of speech crap that... It's a con job. There's no fucking such thing as rights or freedoms of anything. There's living. And, uh, you know, if you want to be sucked into all that uh, shit, that's no, the way I see it. You're, nothing's protected by government. That stuff was supposed to be them being, bless you, dear, 
them being protected uh, from doing things to you, not so as your protection against the government, has turned into government control over you know a couple of hundred years. What was once common is, for example, in George Washington's day, according to the history I've read, the farmer was required to grow a portion of his crop was hemp by law. They needed it because they made everything out of it. Because everything they could make out of hemp would last for fucking ever. You couldn't, couldn't destroy it in your lifetime. And as America grew and businesses and these, what do you call them? The layer, the what? The barons. Well, what they call those guys that built the railroads? Because it all pretty much started to come together at the end of the 1800s. They got rich, greedy fucking slobs that wanted to own the color blue. And then they joined forces together. Now, as long as we're lied to, this thing will continue. It will never end as long as the, the foundation is the bullshit that we're told. And with that, I'll get back to my epic tale about the Jews. But I, I don't know, I felt like ranting. So, eh, I still got plenty of time left here to finish this epic saga. Now, where was I? Rutgers University professor Peter Golden, referred to by Brooke as one of the principal authorities on the Khazars, wrote, Every school child in the West has been told that if not for Charles Martel and the Battle of Poitiers, there might be a mosque where Notre Dame now stands. Oh, they burned Notre Dame down last year. Was it this year? Oh, this year. What few school children are aware of Golden emphasizes is that if not for the Khazars, Eastern Europe might well have become province of Islam. The Khazarian mounted forces was so with a soldiery of mainly Turkic and pagan origin could at times and when accounted for, show a disastrous fearness and cruelty to the enemies of Khazaria. They were also probably the most disciplined, as well as tactically and strategically the most potent. That's a terrible word, mister. <clears throat> Martial power at the time and in that region. Evidence that they were supremely calculating in their approach to international matters lay in the fact that, in contrast to their brutality, Khazar officials were often consulted as diplomatic emissaries and mediators by all the political powers surrounding Khazaria. The Khazars and their empire were at that time both highly respected and greatly feared with good reason. You know, another interrupt. Just get a group of those freaking high-ranking Jews and some of the senators and lock them in a room without any food or water and tell them that only five of you can leave when it's over. <laughs> I bet they resign before you can close the doors. These cowards, they put the kids out there to do the violence, you know, and teach them how to fly a fucking plane or use a, a joystick. So it's less personal. So you can murder with impunity and not have any emotion about it. Whew. Boy, we're in big trouble, folks. <clears throat> okay. At the peak of their empire, it is believed that the Khazars had a permanent standing army that could have numbered as many as 100,000 and controlled or exacted tribute. Hmm. Taxes. Astonishingly, from 30 different nations and tribes inhabiting the vast territories between the Caucasus, the Aral Sea, and oh, the Ural Mountains, and the Ukrainian steeps, during their zenith, Khazaria completely girded the lands of what are currently, boy, this guy writes some unique words, Astrakhan, Kalmykia, Dagestan, Volgograd, ah, I'm reading them in English too, Rostov, 
Oops, Rostov. Hmm. Oh, here we go. I can't do this one. But I'll post it. I posted this. So if you're curious about it, I'll put it in the blog. I can't read. Uh, some of these names are just too foreign for me. North Ossetia, Ossetia, uh, and Chechnya. Hey, said one. <laughs> okay, back to the story. At its maximum extent in the 9th ninth, ninth century geogra geography, <laughs> says Brooke, Kazaria not only encompassed the northern Caucasus and the Volga Delta, but also extended as far west as Kiev, Russia. Wow. Now, just what I mean off my memory of the map, that is a bit of a distance. You know? And it's, uh, I think, uh, my pal was telling me, uh, Austria, where he's going in Austria, is 800 kilometers from here, I think. He was talking in kilometers. But it's relatively, it, on a Harley, that's not a short trip. <laughs> I don't remember bikes being a form of comfort when I did ride them. So, hmm. doing a, doing any kind of distance on a motorcycle, never, I was a dirt rider, I like that shit, but riding a two-wheeler through traffic, and a, nah, that always seemed like a, a dangerous, uh, crazy thing to, to do, not something that was cost-effective, <laughs> cost-effective, anyway, so, I have to keep bouncing back in, and out. this story is so incredibly, hmm, informative but it keeps getting my i'm got a little pipe load before i started the show and it keeps interrupting my pot mind keeps getting interrupt uh, interrupting with my own stuff that this brings up that might not even seem like it's relative at the time but for me there's some kind of connection so i'm going to go back to my store i got a lot to read on this so i can interrupt myself if i want everybody's asleep except Cirque anyway <laughs> and hannah <laughs> And I think the doctor is around here somewhere. Hmm. So, let me see. where. Ah, there he is at my feet. I said his name and he came forth. Now, uh, ah, the Kazarian Mounted Forces. No, I read that paragraph at the peak of the empire. I read that paragraph. Ah, here we go. Soviet archaeologist M.I. Artemenov Monov states that for a century and a half, the Khazars were the supreme masters of the southern half of Eastern Europe and presented a virtually impenetrable bulwark, blocking the Ural-Caspian gateway from Asia into Europe. During that entire period, they held back the onslaught of the nomadic tribes from the east. Hmm. Onslaught of the nomadic tribes. Well, hmm. Well, were they nomadic tribes or were they wandering groups of murdering thieves? Hmm. Maybe that'll that question will come out in the future reading of this epic tale of the Jews. All right. Until recently, a great part of the problem with the historical obscurity of ancient Caesarea lay with the fact that the geographical area of the country was part of the Soviet Union, which insisted on interpreting archaeological data within the framework of Marxist historical materialism. This Iron Curtain version of historical, uh, I can't speak, historical revisionism caused the Soviets to interpret that data in such a way as to present as fact that which was well fabricated, but wrong. Wow, see, and then when you get into this, they told you a story to tell you a story, but the first one, I get confused on who's lying about what. So, ultimately, I would even, at some point, find some of the stuff I'm reading. I go, nah, I don't believe that. Because I'm a negative Nelly, and that's what I do. I always find the, the flaw. You show me the perfect rug. And I'll find the corner or the little, sl just something imperfect in it. And that's what I do. I don't know why. I don't really care for it. I've tried to overcome that. But, you know, you are what you are, I suppose. Hmm. So, this peculiar and obscure race inhabiting that land were described as blue-eyed and of very fair complexion. 
Commonly, they had long reddish hair and were reported as very large of stature and fierce of countenance. Other sources have added observations that there were black Khazars and white Khazars, noting that the latter were light-skinned and handsome, while the former were dark-skinned. This has, however, been rather conclusively refuted by scholars who have established that the distinction was not racial but social. See? Ah, black and white. We come, man, they do this to us all the freaking time. It's nice to read something like this because it just makes what Mary and Vince and Hal and Grimm and Moose, you know, people that do this radio stuff that I know, it, it makes... It makes me see that no matter how little of a thing we're doing, other people are coming forward too. You know, we were just we were just already there. We're older. We knew something. And whether we ever get uh, an audience to hear it or not isn't the fucking point. It's the point is, to me is that we're on the right side of this, so to speak. The right side being nobody's fucking side. Uh <laughs> I know it sounds insane, but I find it very easy to socialize and still not be a, a, a far right or a far left here in, Dem in uh, Denmark. Nobody gives a flying shit about my political opinions where I live. Haven't ever had been asked what if I'm a uh, Democrat or a Republican. The, the only thing anybody ever asked me if I like Trump or not. And when I said I don't really care, they're all the same, that, that was it. Never came up again. They're not even interested in talking about it. So, damn, I think I, uh, <laughs> I think I got what I was looking for. And back to the black and white story. The black, or Kara Khazars, constituted the lower strata, or caste, while the white, or Ak Khazars, were of the noble or royal classes. This type of class distinction was fairly common in Eastern Europe, as evidenced by the more commonly known terms Black Russian and White Russian, denoting not skin color, but class. <laughs> in his book, An Introduction to the History of the Turkic Peoples, Peter Golden claims that the Chinese Tea and Shu Chronicle describes the Khazars generally as tall with red hair, ruddy-faced, and blue-eyed. Black hair is considered a bad omen. <laughs> wow. Uh, the number of games they play with us with this black and white shit, and it still works. I wonder if they didn't uh, purposely do black and white TV for uh, the number of years that it was available when they had color, but they didn't want to make it public. And they even made a, a different, you know, course. You'd have to make a color set. You have your black and white set. But even until the 60s, there was a lot of TV that was filmed in black and white to the early 60s, I remember. I think the Twilight Zone, some of my favorite stuff was done in black and white. You had to use your imagination to, to figure out what the monster, what color was the monster, because they were gray. Uh Twilight Zone, Outer Limits. There's not much left in, in the memory, but a few things like that. And uh, as, what you call it, YouTube gets, I don't know, what the fuck's with YouTube. But over the years, they the, what was available a couple years ago, you could find it without a problem. It's gone, it's erased, or whatever. And now, there's some people posting stuff that I gave up looking for. And I just had, a, like music, I don't do much else with it anymore. And uh, I'm looking for it, and boom, there it is. Just had a feeling that just give it the old, you know, the old uh, school of hard knocks. Try one more time. Hmm. And now, boys and girls, we'll continue with the Khazars of Conquest and War. Wow. I hope some people really get a hold of this. This is brilliant. Of the ferocity and warlike tendencies of the Khazars, there is little doubt and much historical evidence, all of it pointing to a race of people so violent in their dealings with their fellow men 
that they were feared and abhorred above all peoples in that region of the world. Hmm. Well, I can think of a country that's close to that right now, but I ain't going to say it out loud, America. Oh, sorry, guys. The Arab Chronicler, I B N Said Al Maghribi. <laughs> yeah, uh, John Mc, McRib. I don't fucking know. Writes, they are to the north of the inhabited Earth towards the seventh clime having over their heads the constellation of the plow. Their land is cold and wet. Accordingly, their complexions are white, their eyes blue, their hair flowing, and predominantly reddish. Their bodies large and their natures cold. Their general aspect is wild. Wow, well, we need a country like that to come back. Hmm. Oh, it'd be a lot of fun. We could call them. The social reject country. <laughs> anyway, the ninth century monk. <laughs> now here we go. This ninth century references to me still. You know their story. Maybe it happened. Maybe it didn't. Maybe what I'm reading might have happened. Maybe it didn't. But the results that we're in kind of shows you where some of this stuff really just. If you cannot look at it and see the, that it's true, then it's because you don't want to. And that is the freedom that. We're all talking about me and Grim and Rob and Vinny. Well, maybe Vinny's a little more to the state side of it, but uh, the rest of us, you know, figure it out for yourself. And the sad thing is, there is only one true answer in, in this equation. So until you see that particular thing in that particular light, there's going to be that appearance of a side that you're choosing. And it's not. It's the illusion of that because the truth doesn't need protection. It just needs to be fucking noticed. You know, it's, uh, it's all this lifetime of people putting makeup on and going to gyms and, you know, buying fancy cars and living in houses and all this shit. You overlook what you're seeing because you're so you spoiled by this fake shit that when something's real, it really... It doesn't translate to the modern fucking mind. I grew up knowing it, and I saw society try to strip me of it, and I went, fuck you, I ain't going that way. And fortunately, you know, it cost me a, a family. My family's not pleased with me. Most of the people in my past, no, because <laughs> I'm not, I won't commit to this government, you know, state, business, do it like this, do it like that life, and here we go. So, oh wow, so I'm reading this crazy story and it keeps getting me interrupting myself with my own shit. Hmm. I would hope it would do that with you too. Maybe that's the point of me reading this particular story. Because how you see it is subjective and if you're seeing it on the side you're forced to look at only for fear of prosecution, then you're not free. Then that's what being a victim and a slave is. Is doing what your master tells you because you have to. If you don't, you're going to be punished. Well, a lot of us don't give a shit about the punishment. You're not going to tell me what to believe, when to believe it, how to believe it, how to repeat it. I'm going to come up with my own stuff and I'm going to throw my own stuff in it. And if you don't fucking like it, well, there you go. That's the part that throws people off. They, they don't see the freedom in you can listen and not agree without getting pissed off about it because I don't think I'm trying to force you to join my group. I'm trying to tell you there is no group to join. You're on your own. And that's what I respect about Rob Grimner, uh, the crowd anti. People that participate in this little group, Woody. You know, they play the fucking game in life. They do the things they got to do, but the game does not own their outspoken behavior. And like Woody, Woody, uh, Vinny, sorry, Woody, Vinny and Rob don't get along. Then they get along again. Then they don't get along. Then they get along. And that's just because that's the way they are. They're fucking around. They're giving everybody a giggle. And once I realized that, hey, wait a minute, you know, it's the couple that breaks up every Friday night. And then, you know, you pick sides and you don't like her anymore because she dumped him. 
And then Monday morning they get back, back together and they both, hey, get the fuck away. You picked her over me. and Hey, she's mine. <laughs> so what you learn in life is to roll with the punches. Or be one of the guys doing the punching. Or be one of the guys getting your ass kicked. Or stay out of it. There's three choices for everybody all the time. You know, you, you can interact, you can not interact. Or you can just stay the fuck out of it and just watch and have an opinion, which doesn't hurt anyone in the end anyway. Your opinion will not change my life. My opinion will. Whoa, Nittenstein is coming over for her stuff. My my wife got a little cold, so she's going to spend her morning knitting something. Isn't that a... Wow. That, see what I mean? Poor sir, she got a little bit of a head cold in it. Made her feel a little sick, so she's home. Uh, anyway, back to my epic story. Where we at? I got another 35, oh, 25 minutes to, what would you call it? Uh, chip away <laughs> The ninth century monk, Druthmar of Aquitaine, in his commentary on Matthew 24, 14, in Expositio in Matthew Evangelistum stated <laughs> that the Gazari or Kozars dwelt in the lands of Gog and Magog. Wow, there this is incredible. Legends say legends and stories abound, some of which are true according to the above quoted Aquitaine monk that center around Alexander the Great and his attempt to enclose the Khazars and quarantine them due to their violent and barbaric nature from the rest of the civilized world. This endeavor apparently failed, and Druthmar claimed, and they escaped. Some legends even claim they were cannibals. Wow. After the kingdom's conversion to Judaism, the term Red Jews came into usage out of the superstition of medieval Germans, who equated their red hair and beards and their violent nature with deceit and dishonesty. It is also well documented that they heavily taxed those passing through their lands, for none dared refuse them. Of course, it was well documented. Hmm. I wonder what happened to those documents. That would be interesting to see a document from 900. Hey, the 900 times from uh, Gog and Magog. <laughs> anyway, according to Benjamin H. Friedman, himself a Jew and apparent longtime associate and confidant of presidents and statesmen, so this pig is up to his eyes and shit. He's going to lie to you with every breath he's got in him. In an address presented in 1961 at the Willard Hotel in Washington, D.C., the Khazars were so belligerent and hostile that they were eventually run out of Asia and scattered amongst the nations of Eastern Europe. Heinrich von Neustadt, around 1300, wrote of them as the terrifying people of Gog and Magog. Wow, saying that's just kind of weird, because uh, I think I got I got something out of that vibration stuff. And the resonance. And I, yeah, there's got to be something to it more than I'm capable of knowing. I've got that part figured out. So when I have to give something so much attention, think about it to make it real, That's I think that's what's... Uh, the the link you know when i'm not accustomed to something it's hard to break in a new habit only imagine if that new habit was that everything that i've ever heard out of the government in any country i've ever lived in has all been based on bullshit that has got to be mind numbing i can only imagine luckily for me i don't have a mind to numb <laughs> i gave you one guys hey it was free now the territory of the Bulgars, themselves legendary for their fierceness in battle, was conquered by the Khazars in A.D. 6, 4, and 2. Uh-huh, yeah, 
that see here we go that historical shit but now the lay of the land and artifacts and crap like that would probably convince me if I was interested enough to prove it one way or the other I would wonder if there is any physical proof I could lay my eyeball on and see yeah, never know a portion of them fled westward to the region of the Danube in the Balkans and formed what is now modern-day Bulgaria. Wow, and Bulgaria went through a good period of time, like three or four years, without a sitting government in this uh, last ten years, I believe. I think they got a sitting government today, but they, they didn't for a number of years. And the reason I bring it up is they still functioned as a government. They still functioned as a state or whatever this global crap is. They're recognized as Bulgaria, even though they didn't have uh, hired, paid, sitting representation. So there's a lot more to this uh, government crap we're living in. It all comes down to, in my opinion, commerce. commerce we're treated like fucking cattle. Try traveling and tell me that you're not. You know, when the guy wants to stick his finger up your ass to see if you're carry, carrying yellow cake or not, and all you can do is say, wait a minute, <laughs> that you cannot have my beauty. What are you thinking? <laughs> now, I got my wife. No, don't do that. Okay, I got headphones on, sweetie. Anyway, yeah, I know they got a sitting government now, but they didn't for about three or four years in the last ten. I remember reading about it. Oh, they still don't have one. Oh, Den, okay, Cirque's trying to, t I got headphones on. She is informing me on my side. Denmark does not have a sitting government right now, right? Okay, so, and here we are. I don't see riding in the streets. I don't see people turning their back on each other. It's, they had the elections at, what, a couple, week or two ago? The 5th of June. So here we are, 13 days without a sitting government, and the country has managed to not fall apart because no there's nobody to guide us see it's it's all an illusion and the illusion is made real by the belief that it's there because when it ain't there and you, it doesn't fucking matter it's still it's still all in your fucking head what matters is the enforcement taken by your representatives through thugs and bullies and if they can keep that to a minimum it really doesn't matter who's sitting in power or what. It, hmm. Wow. I, I don't even know if I can explain how I want to explain that. So I'm going to abandon it and go back to my story. But that was my wife throwing some new information at me. And me reporting it to you. <laughs> it is not difficult to determine to, excuse me, to determine some of the motivating factors behind the legendary Khazar ferocity in war. When the Beck, the Khazar head of the military and second in command, only to the Kagan himself, sends out a body of troops, they do not in any circumstances retreat. Wow. Hmm. They are de if they are defeated, everyone who returns to him is killed. Sometimes he cuts out every one of them in two and cru crucifies them, and sometimes he hangs them by the neck from trees. You see, and it sounds like that uh, that scary guy at the window thing with that my my father taught me about it real young, so I wouldn't. Every little noise wouldn't scare me, you know. That, no, nah, I'm not like that. Get my attention. I can hear a cat cry in my sleep because I'm tuned into the damn cat. But I don't wake up when I hear traffic rolling down the road. Or maybe it might make me turn. I'm, I wake up for a second. I might notice that, but I'll go right back to sleep. So I don't live in that level of fear and, oh, they're going to come and get me. Help, help, help. Yeah, that's, for, that's for people that vote. Anyway, back to my epic tale. Logically, it seems that this would not likely happen more than once, since reason would reveal to even the dullest soldier that defeat was not an option. Such a practice would also have provided a strong impetus to the legend of Khazar fierceness, since 
When faced with the choice of winning in battle or facing a worse death at home, the options and the rational responses to them become painfully distinct. Yeah, you know, because they had that facial recognition and documents to prove you're who you were. And, right. I would bet you in those times in, in history, how few people traveled more than 20 miles in any direction is probably minimal. <laughs> what would the point have been? You know, uh, shoo. and there weren't that as many. See, there weren't as many people then as there are now. So they're playing off our ability to uh, imagine. Imagine 900 BC, 100,000 100, troops. I've never seen in my life together at one time 100,000 troops physically. Seen it on film, but that number of, uh, wow. I don't think that Camp Lejeune had that many personnel when I was there. I knew they had thousands and thousands of these kids. The, the city population was somewhere around 80 or 100 because a lot of people you know, lived there with their families or not with their families, but they, uh, yeah, their families were military, therefore, but they would live on base or whatever and still come visit their folks and whatnot. Um, hmm. I don't know. I just remember a different world than the one that I've read about over the last 10 years. Now, where was I in this epic saga of... Hey, check this shit out. This will floor you. Okay. Hmm. Ah, I think... Here we go. All these facts mingled with the semi-factual legends of Alexander the Great and his attempts to wall up the Red Jews and isolate them has led to the numerous mythologies of the coming escape at the end of time of Gog and Magog from the area enclosed by the Cassasus Mountains. This, as the legends say, in order to fulfill Bible prophecy in the final destruction of the world, indeed, even Islam has such legends in its mythology. I wonder what the difference between mythology and history is. Oh, the listener, that's right. <laughs> you know, because... Uh, I'm not so sure that that there aren't aliens. I just think that if there are, we're the aliens, not this every other person in or it's, what do you call it? Uh, the lizard people or uh, there's two there's no way to explain anything. Theories. We think this happened and we think that happened and if you look at this particular thing and Three o'clock in the afternoon, facing that direction, holding your left nut with your right hand, then you too will see the mysteries that we have been shown. But you have to see, you have to do the rituals and wear the right color robe and be told by the right person or it doesn't have any value. Then it doesn't have any fucking value in the first place. That, But we're conned at it. If you stand and you know wear the robe and you got the tassel thing hanging off your stupid hat, and you've, you know, rubbed the right nuts along the way to get wherever you go. Uh, there you go. You're successful, lucky bastard. Now go to work. And don't stop until I tell you you can stop. <laughs> okay. Let's see. I got, I got led astray one more time. Uh, now, in a writing, these names are killing me. By the Imam Ibn Kathir, yeah, him. He asserts that the Prophet Muhammad has claimed every day Gog and Magog are trying to dig a way out through the barrier, the Caucasus Mountains. When they begin to see sunlight through it, the one who is in charge of them says, Go back. You can carry on digging tomorrow. And then... They come back. And when they come back, the barrier is stronger than it was before. This will continue until their time comes and Allah wishes to send them forth. Wow, that's some pretty bizarre shit religious people believe. But, you know, I guess, whatever floats your boat. I think it was Cowboy Tech that asked, uh, asked me on the RLM chat earlier about what 
has God done for you? And I responded to him, I don't ask God what he says or does. <laughs> it doesn't never occur to me to, you know, whatever runs life or whatever you call that shit, to even question it. It seems kind of pointless. It's like explaining to somebody why I like the taste of chocolate. The only answer there is, I like it. Where do you go from there? I, I don't know. Doesn't make any sense to not know. You got to know something. Well, because I like it, and that's the end of it. But you know what? There's people out there in the world that'll push you and push you and push you until you say what they want to hear. And some of them are nice about it, like me. <laughs> and some of them are not so nice about it, like uh, Rob. <laughs> Mr. Sarcasm. Rob's not nice about it. Me, I don't know. I might be interpreted by a few as rude and uh, cruel. But I don't I don't recognize it because it's not my, my intention. I like to be a smartass to the people that play that game. And the people that don't, I just don't. Leave them be. Yeah. they got enough problems already, obviously, so why add to it? And I'm going to stand on that decision until I change my mind. And I've come up to the end. I'm going to cut out of here early. There's a lot of more reading on this. This is a great a great story. I hope it gets out there into the, the uh, electronic world and people take a little time to check it out. It's pretty damn interesting, people. Anyway, that will end my Danish in a perfect world, <laughs> Danish, ah, it's too funny, uh, in a perfect world this morning here, and when uh, we got coming, I have to remember the schedule in my head, we got Wednesday and Friday nights at 7 o'clock on the East Coast, you got Graham Z and the Rocket Chair Podcast, but not this week, she took this week off, but her normal schedule, less this week, is Wednesday and Friday at 7 and uh, Thursday, I pop in the middle at 2 o'clock on a normal time for the RLM folk that do listen uh, on the East Coast. And I do 20% off because that's when I get to be 20% off. I don't, I have no idea. And uh, Friday night, 11 o'clock on the East Coast, the Grimner and the Moose Girl team up for the Freakers Ball. And they talk about stuff that's going on, shit like I do, and then but they got the extra thing with the music. And uh Grim plays some music, but he doesn't uh they don't download it to the rerun. So if you're gonna catch the music, you gotta check in with him at eleven o'clock on Friday night. And he plays some really good stuff. And Saturday, I'm coming back with the Dork Table at twelve o'clock on the East Coast. Uh, I've been trying to get Miss Mary to come back and visit me, so mm, and I, I missed her one week, and then the week I come back, she was gone. So we have a, we just our time schedules have been not colliding like they used to, and she was the best uh, dork table partner I ever had. So hope send out the brainwaves to get her back, and then Sunday Grimner comes on with the blues in the morning, till we play trivia in the afternoon. And then 3 o'clock on the west coast of the U.S., Hal Anthony, behind the woodshed, comes out with a little cricket bash and slap those crickets around and get them to pay attention. And then Monday night, 7 o'clock on the east coast, Grimner comes back with Grim Leftovers. I listened to your show last night before I did this show this morning, and uh, I would definitely recommend, if you're listening to this and you want to be entertained and hear another crazy outside of the box, you know, person looking on the game. Grimner would be the guy. And uh, outside of that, I'll be back next Tuesday in the middle of a freaking night while you're sleeping. <laughs> and uh, I'll do another crazy uh, tw in a perfect world in a perfect world solo, Les Vinny. And Les Vinny shows up and then we'll do it together. So for me, I see you. Thanks a lot. and Goodbye. Bye.